Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar um, for this Friday. We've actually got Place Technologies um, speaking about how healthy is my business, financial forecasting 101. Um, we've got Alex Ziegler, who's head of alliances at Place Technologies, as well as Brandon Metcalf, who's the Place founder and CEO. And my name is Beth Darby, and I'm head of sales with Awesome Technology Council. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and present um, Alex and Brandon to take over. All right. Thank you, Beth. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, everybody who's on the webinar and for uh, the recorded version. As Beth mentioned, I'm Alex Siegler. I'm the head of alliances at Place Technology. We're a software company that enables founders and operators to make better decisions about their business via financial forecasting. Um, today, we're going to shine the spotlight on Brandon Metcalf, Place's founder and CEO, and he's also a founder and board member at Blueprint Advisory, a product development outsourcing firm. So, Brandon, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Alex. Let's jump right in. Um, so, why is forecasting important, and what do so many business owners get wrong about financial forecasting? I mean, that's a, we could talk about that for a couple hours on itself, but, you know, I think um, the way that I look at forecasting, it's really just coming up with a plan and um, being able to leverage that plan to help you figure out what you want to do with, with the business. Like a really good example is COVID. Uh, COVID came out in what March is when we all started to really feel the impact and, you know, having a uh, financial plan to figure out what you're going to do during COVID is, is, I think critical um, to survive and actually somewhat thrive throughout uh, the pandemic. And it's just one good example of, you know, why why it's so important. Um, when when all of that started, the first thing that I did is went to my forecast and said, okay, let's plan for the worst case here. What happens if sales hit five percent or sales completely go away? What are the different options that I would have to run the business and keep the business alive? Um, if we don't have any sales in nine months, what are, what are things that I can slow down, things that I can cut, things that I can rearrange? Um, with, in my mindset, I was looking at it as to, I don't want to have to lay off staff. Um, so what, what options do I have? So being able to leverage a forecast to tell me not just what's happening from a profit and loss standpoint, but also from, from a cash flow standpoint, which I think, you know, talking about what do business owners potentially get wrong with forecasting, I think forecasting is not just your p and um, I actually think forecasting the p and is a lot easier um, than, than forecasting cash flow. Cash flow is one of the most difficult things to forecast, but it's one of the most critical things to forecast as, as well, to really understand the money that's going to come in and out of the business and why, so that you can make decisions, especially in the time of a crisis, um, to look at what are ways that you can save cash, increase, increase cash, defer payments, things like that, so that you really can stretch every dollar as long as, as you can, especially when, when revenue potentially might be slowed or, or non-existent. Absolutely. So, I mean, let's give the audience a little bit of context here. Um, you weren't always a super forecaster and you're not an accountant. I am not, um, but I've been running businesses for, for a pretty long time. So, you know, my backstory is I started another company in 2009 um, called Talent Rover that was uh, really an operating system for staffing and recruiting firms. And, you know, at the time when I started that business, I had never built a business, never ran a software company or never even actually worked in software before. My, my background was in financial services and then in staffing. And I came up with the idea for Talent Rover because I was frustrated with the software that we had available in staffing. Um, but, you know, staffing and software are two different businesses. So, you know, we started building the product and for the first couple of years, really, we're just trying to figure out how do you run a software company? Um, and then things started to click and we started to build momentum and we started to gain customers and we started to gain customers around the world. And all of a sudden we were running a real software company and we had to figure out how to best run that company. Um, that company, we, we raised quite a bit of money because we needed to. We were growing like crazy, and we also went from selling to SMB space to selling to enterprise. Um, and, you know, a couple of years into the business, we actually sold to a division of ADECO, which led to us winning the entire ADECO global relationship, which was kind of interesting because we had like 45 employees at the time, and we were selling to this 33,000 employee company uh, with 
operations in more more than 40 different countries. So we had to figure out how to grow the build business, how to build the business. So I developed all of these financial models to, to start doing that, both initially from the profit and loss standpoint, then I realized in order for us to scale and to stay afloat, I really need to understand cash flow. And um, our, our fundraising story with Talent Rover was all basically all angel investors. So we raised $28 million over the course of the business um, from primarily 15 angel investors. And, you know, we needed or I needed to know what was happening with the business to be able to tell these angel investors, you know, where the money was going, why we needed what we needed. And um, I was essentially forced to figure out forecasting. Um, and we built these models in Excel. They were pretty extensive. They were pretty complicated. We tried to switch to software to help us do this as well, but we really, there was just no software that was available that really met the need. So we went back to our forecast. We hired fractional CFOs. We brought in, you know, more financial experts and they really helped us perfect these, these models. Um, and we continue to use them throughout the life of the business. And not only did it help us know how much cash we needed to raise and when, um, it also gave us the ability to really understand all of the aspects for the business. So, you know, in 2016, 2017-ish, uh, we were going to look at doing finally a Series A, mostly because these large um, multi-billion dollar staffing firms that we were selling licenses to were really concerned that we did not have, have institutional backing. So we started that process and that process, if you've ever raised money from an institution, you've got to have your financials put together. They're going to want to look at them. They're going to want to see if you understand really what's going on with the business. And then definitely as you, as you go through diligence, you have to explain it. And when we were doing the series A, our, our biggest competitor, um, also became very interested in acquiring us. And, you know, for the longest time, it was no, 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 no. And eventually we said yes, because uh, the deal made sense. Um, but we were able to really leverage these financial forecasts to, to help us negotiate a better deal because what these things enabled us to do is not only see what potential outcomes would be, but we were so granular with understanding what every single number was and also the, the changes that could happen. You know, what happens if we hit 150% of sales or what happens if we hit 15% of sales, what's the outcome? So when we were talking about valuations and, and what the sales price should be for the company, we were actually really able to know what the value of the company was to negotiate where we should, where we should end up. So, you know, it was through that exercise that I really learned the value of why these forecasts are so important, but I also learned how difficult and time consuming and tedious these things can be. Um, which is why we wanted to take that information and, and figure out how to, to how to help other companies. And, and that's why we created Place. But, you know, it just depends on what you have going on with the business as to the level of, of complexity these forecasts will take on. But they are, we used to, we used to name the, the forecasting spreadsheets that I had the beast because it truly was a beast to manage. Um, but the value we got was tremendous. The beast. And I've seen that spreadsheet. It's uh pretty daunting. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a spreadsheet with as many columns um, <laughs> and as many tabs. I'm sure there's bigger ones, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a big one. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, at Talent Rover, you had somewhere in the, in the range of like 40 to 50 employees and you're selling to companies that have thousands of employees. Um, there's a lot of folks that might be in the audience today or, or listening to this webinar later who uh, feel like it's it's they're too small to start forecasting. So in your mind, um, how small is too small to start forecasting for your business? I think it's, a, I think it's an interesting question. I also think um, there's there's typically a perception too of you know if you're if you're building a business that you are bringing in external capital or venture capital in for that you that's when you need to have financial forecasts and and all of that built out, which I think you do. But you know Blueprint, our our other company. Um, it's a very small boutique uh, product development company. So we help other companies build Salesforce-based products and that company has five employees. So, you know, you could easily look at that company and say, yeah, you don't need to build a financial forecast um, to really support it. But I'll tell you, it's the exact opposite. Like over the past couple of weeks, um, I've been really looking at Blueprint 
because the business is strong. The business is, is doing really well, uh, which is somewhat surprising with, with the global pandemic going on. But I think the Salesforce and uh, ecosystem in general is, is a bit on fire right now. So it, it does make sense for Blueprint to be busy. But with having five employees, it, it's really easy to you know, see the number of projects that we have, understand the cash that we're spending today and what that looks like. But by having true financial forecasts built out, it's not just what's happening today, it's what's happening six months, nine months, 24 months from now, looking at you know, what's gonna happen as we go through this election, what's gonna happen in 2021. I think 2020 taught us a lot that you just don't know um, what really is gonna happen. None of us prepared for a global pandemic as we started 2020. So looking at Blueprint and, and what Blueprint's up to, I can actually look at these forecasts. I can make some assumptions as to, okay, this is how many customers I think we're gonna bring on and why, and this is what we're gonna need to be able to support those customers and why. Um, and then I can also look at the cash flow and say, you know, how much cash do we have? How much cash do we need? Do I need to stretch cash if, uh, cash if things go wrong? Where can I best, uh, best utilize this cash now to, to help us? How much of a risk do I wanna take? I think a lot of founders um, and business owners uh, have a gut sense of the business. And I have a gut sense of both place and, and blueprint and what we're doing. But by putting things down so that you can actually see them and then being able to change the assumptions and change you know, what happens if, um, and being able to leverage these models to give you some different plans as to, great, if business continues as it is, we're gonna make all of this money and I can do all of this with, with it and we can continue to grow the company or you know, if all of a sudden in March, we have to shut down the economy again, what does that look like? It, it gives you peace of mind and it gives you actions to take so that when you're paying attention to the business and when your gut's telling you what's gonna happen with the business, you actually have something to validate it against to know that yes, your, your intuition is on track or hey, you might be off because there could be things that you've never uh, had happen, uh, happening to the business now and how do you plan for it? I know for me, um, I get a lot of anxiety if I don't have a plan. Um, so putting things down and actually having these forecasts just helps me be more effective because I can focus on really what's happening and not start to get anxiety about what could happen um, because at the end of the day, things are going to happen that you never planned for and you've got to plan for it. So you mentioned um, like a cash forecast and a P&L forecast. How would you quickly explain the difference and why one is useful sometimes and another is useful in others? Yeah, and it really depends on what you're doing. Um, like the P&L obviously is very important. It's going to tell you from an accounting standpoint, the, the profit and loss for the business and how successful the business is. So when you start talking to external people about the health of the business, they're gonna to wanna to look at that um, to see, you know, what's your growth rate? Um, what are you spending money on? And really what's your, your net income profitability of the business? They're also gonna to wanna to look at the balance sheet too, to determine, you know, what assets do you have and, and what liabilities you have and really what's the true value of the company. And I think you have to balance those two things. Um, cash is cash is different. Um, cash, where I look at cash as knowing what options do I really have. I think, especially in a smaller company and in with Place, a company that is just two years old, I look at cash to to determine what we can really do. Um, you know, my last company was a very high growth software company, and needing to know hey, we need $300,000 next month, or we need $3 million the month after that, depending on what's happening, gives us the ability to actually decide what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. Um, it you know, simple things like if I hire an employee, sure, I can look at what their wages are and come up with an idea as to what that employee is going to cost. But that's not the true cost of employee. What about you know, their benefits? What about all their equipment? What about all the miscellaneous expenses that go along with them? What about payroll taxes and, and all of that? And then how do you actually pay for all of that stuff? Sure, you're going to pay your employee on your pay cycle, which is usually you know, twice a month, once a week, every other week, things like that. But when do you pay health insurance? When do you have to buy their computer? All of those costs add up and you need to know when they're gonna come in and out so that you can actually determine, and we're doing this at place right now, like we're, we're scaling the sales team and we're looking at growing the company and I have to balance the growth in doing that with the cost that it's gonna entail. In building out a sales team, there's gonna be a lot of cost up front, and then we're banking on 
our sales team abilities to hit sales quota and sales targets to offset the cost. And, you know, what's the balance there? How do you, how do you actually get to a state of profitability? How do you know when your salesperson is actually covering their cost and, and valuable? And I think these models and especially the cash flow model really tells you that. And a lot of times when you look at it, you'd be surprised. And we, I literally just did this week where we're, deciding if we're going to hire how many salespeople we're going to hire and what the cash flow is going to look from that. And I was surprised that it was saying to wait to hire more salespeople versus my gut was saying hire more salespeople um, from a cash flow standpoint. So again, having these models just gives you more data, more intelligence to, to leverage, to make the right decisions. And for me, waiting an extra month to hire a salesperson um, on a cash flow standpoint makes sense. Then you balance it out with the business side. Like if I have a really good salesperson that I'm interviewing, I can then look and look at the cash flow and look at the opportunity and make the right decision for the business. But then I know all of the data points going into it versus just guessing. So let's drill down a little bit into the, the true brass tacks of a forecast. What are what are some of the basics that would go into a financial model or a, or a forecast for anyone trying to do that? Yeah, and this is a question I get asked a lot. Like, where do you start? Um, I've never built a forecast before. How do you do this? Um, you can hire, you know, external help, fractional CFOs, and and those groups are brilliant at what they do, and definitely an opportunity there. Um, I think one of the challenges that I personally experienced with fractional CFOs is do they really get the business and do they understand the business well enough to know um, what's going to truly happen? I think you have to be in the business to really validate those types of things. Um, but they're great to start with and they're great consultants and they're great to make sure that once you have an understanding of your business that it logically makes sense. Um, but I think as a starting point, is really understanding just your P&L and understanding why your P&L works the way that it works. So like if you're in a software company, understanding how revenue recognition actually works for, for your company. Um, looking at the revenue and the charges that are coming in and that are hitting your accounting system and do you actually understand what they are and why they're, why they're there. Um, and then taking that information and thinking about you know, what's going to happen into the future? What's going to happen next month? What's going to happen next quarter? A lot of financial forecasting softwares will do percentages of growth or percentages of change or averages or things like that. For me, that doesn't really work very well, especially in a high growth startup company where talent over, um, you know, we were growing 3000% year over year. So to use just percentages was um, not very accurate and it definitely wasn't accurate on, on the cash flow standpoint. So figuring out a model that allows you to rule in those assumptions of, okay, what happens if next month we quadruple the number of sales and all of that. But it starts with understanding what's actually happening in the business today. It starts with understanding why your chart of account is structured the way it is, why your P&L is structured the way it is, understanding what's the difference between a balance sheet and a P&L. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting where a lot of founders don't understand truly um, the differences with a lot of that. And I didn't when I started Talent Rover. I was not a trained accountant. And it's somewhat checking your ego aside and just getting granular and asking for help and realizing that, it's okay not to know all of these details, but you need to know all of them in order to really know what's happening with the business so that you can catch both the good things and the bad things. Um, and hopefully it'll make you better. But uh, if you're gonna start, start by just digging in and asking a lot of questions about your P&L so that it fully makes sense. And then the secondary piece is, is asking about cash flow asking about you know why money is coming in and why money is going out the way that it is you know you sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of your product today that doesn't mean you have a hundred thousand dollars in cash today um so understanding payment terms payment frequency the method that you're paying things on um and factoring that in will will start to teach you how your business actually operates and that will be when you can actually start to build up a, a, a true forecast so what would you say to those founders here um, who rely 100% on the forecast that their outsourced accountant or uh, CFO gives to them? Yeah, I mean, again, I think, I think those resources are extremely valuable. I've always used CPA firms. And like I said, we brought in fractional CFOs and all of that to help us. And I think those are the experts. They know 
you know, why things that work, work the way they do and what they've seen in other companies that are similar to you. Um, so they can give a lot of really solid, good advice. So I definitely recommend using those resources. But I do think, um, again, to what I was saying before, only you really know your business. Um, they are there to advise you and guide you, but you know, you know, realistically, how well is the sales team doing? You know, you know, XYZ customer, they're probably not going to pay their bills on time or they're going to be on time or, or what have you. You know the performance of your team and you, if you have risk with those employees and, you know, you know what's just happening in your industry and what your customers are saying. So leveraging those external sources is great, but understanding your numbers and really understanding what's happening in your business, it, you just can't replace that with an external vendor. So what's something that would prevent a founder or business owner from doing forecasting? I think a lot of people are intimidated by it because it is, it is a challenge. I mean, there's, I look at um, accounting as a, as a science and forecasting as an art to a certain extent. Um, so I think just the, just getting started with it and understanding, okay, what, what do I put in Excel or, you know, what software do I use or how do I do this? And then, I also think there is, do you really understand your P&L and your accounting today enough to really know what's happening and why? I think those are the big things to start with. Um, but if, especially on a smaller company, if you've never built a company before, if you ask for help, there's tremendous amount of resources out there to help you. I think for other companies, um, once you get busy, financial forecasting is extremely tedious um, and time consuming if you don't have the right tools or technology. So one, investing in software that can help you um, and also making sure that you invest in an in accounting or finance person. I think a lot of times smaller and mid-sized companies wait too long to hire that finance person and it's a cost. And when you're looking at growing a business, you want to save every cost and that's not a revenue producing cost per se, but it's, it, they can help you save money. They can make sure you're looking at the right things. If they're internal and full-time, they can actually get plugged into the business and understand the business. So um, if you're not the finance person yourself, I, I think it is an investment in hiring that person that's worth every penny. Absolutely. Um, so we heard a bit about how you do this and what influenced you to become better at forecasting. So how does place technology fit into this? Yeah, I mean, place, I wanted to take the, the 10 years that we, we had with building out these models, with actually using these models on a daily basis, with seeing what's working, what's not working, what we had to pivot, what we also had to pivot in the business. I mean, as much as Talent Rover was, at the end of the day, viewed as a, as a really big success and we had a great return, it was a, quite the experience of building out the company, raising all that money, making changes. We had offices in, in uh, eight countries, so we were constantly all over the place. Um, so we want to take all of that blood, sweat, and tears that we, we gained from that experience and actually make it available to other companies so that finance doesn't have to be so intimidating. It doesn't have to be, you know, this big monumental task where we wanted to simplify the whole process so that you can actually see the numbers when you need to see the numbers and make the decision. So, you know, regardless if you look at Place or, or any of the other FP&A software that's out there, I think they all have different use cases. We have a different use case for many of our competitors, but the, the big thing, if I was gonna buy FP&A software is how fast can I get my numbers? How accurate are my numbers? And how easy is it is to share the numbers with the rest of the team to the people that need them? Um, because that's really when you can operationalize this financial data and make better decisions based off of it, which will help the company overall just be more successful. Yeah, and we can, we can talk a bit more about that. Um, but we do have a, a question from, from the audience, from Wesley. And Wesley, I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna rephrase it a little bit. Um, the question is focused a little bit on like what goes into a build versus buy decision. And, and this usually really applies to software companies. So how do you use forecasting or how would you recommend someone uses forecasting or scenario building um, to, to really think about their, their software cases for build versus buy? 
No, at, at Talent River, we competed with this a lot where we were a full-blown operating system for a staffing and a recruiting firm. So we handled sales recruiting in the whole back office, invoicing, timesheets, all of those different types of things. And that product was built on Salesforce, um, just like places. And, you know, Salesforce was also very motivated to get staffing firms to build their own version of Talent Rover. Um, so we lived this experience of, of having to help customers negotiate through this and figuring out, does it make more sense to buy versus build? Um, I think from a, from a financial forecasting standpoint, you've really got to understand both sides of the costs. Like, do you really understand all the costs that go into building software? Do you understand all the costs that goes into maintaining and supporting that software? Do you understand, you know, how much it's going to take for you to keep up with uh, the technology evolving, meaning, you know, the pre-built software, typically, um, those companies are looking for ways to continuously to improve their software, to make it better, to make it more efficient, to give, it, give their customers use, more use cases. So if you're going to build it on your, on your own, if you're going to build it internally, you can be much more specific with what your business needs and why your business needs it to be the way that it is. But then how do you actually make sure that it's evolving? Um, I think quantifying those costs, I think, you know, there's a lot of cool platforms out there. We love the Salesforce platform because you can do a lot of this on Salesforce and you can save a tremendous amount of cost by building technology on Salesforce, but there's other platforms and there's also still the ability to do it on premise yourself. But how do you go through then and quantify all those costs? And I think it takes a lot of time to actually understand, you know, what servers are going to cost and what headcounts it's going to cost and all these other peripheral things. Um, if you've ever built software, I think you'll have a much better understanding. If you haven't ever built software, I, that's a really good time to look for a fractional CFO or someone like that that's been with companies that have done this and that have seen the finances that they can advise you of. Here's all the other costs that you need to take into consideration when looking at this. And then do an ROI comparison as to, okay, how fast are you going to get your money back from the build, first of all, and then how much money are you going to spend annually to then maintain and uh, upgrade and evolve it, and then compare that with any of the software that's out um, in the market today, and then also weigh that with what are you going to be missing out, what customizations are so unique to you that you're not going to have with that off-the-shelf software, and look at that to make the decision as to, as to which way you should go. Yeah, that's a, that's a great take. So um, as we wrap up here, really appreciate your time, Brandon and ATC for hosting this. And um, just want to give uh, a, a quick pointer to our website and our blog. You can, you can follow uh, the, the writings and musings of not only Brandon, but the rest of our team. Uh, on the finances of, of running a small business. Um, there is a great blog post on there that uh, I think we can send out as a link about um, how businesses fail because of cash flow problems and three uh, tips to fix those cash flow problems. Um, also feel free to check out Place CPM, our flagship product on the app exchange, the Salesforce app exchange. You can get to that via our website, placetechnology.com. Um, feel free to contact us with any other questions. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, we'll be back for a, a few more webinars with ATC. And with that, I'd like to say again, thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Alex. And I would just say too, I, I love talking to other business owners and founders and all of that about these topics. So regardless if you buy our software or not. so. Feel free to ping me. I'd love to chat. And uh, thanks again for the question, Wes. I thought it was a really good one. All right. And we'll go ahead and pass it over to Beth with ATC. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex and Brandon. Some great information here. Um, if anybody does have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to ATC and we'll get those questions over to Alex and Brandon to answer. Our um, email is info at austintechnologycouncil.com. Org. Um, we will be having another webinar next Friday on August 27th. Um, so feel free to take a look at our events calendar and register for that. So I just hope everybody has a great weekend. Stay safe and we'll see you soon.